Aussie farmers. Order. It being 2 p.m. in accordance with sessional order 106A, the, the time for member statements has concluded. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister will be aware of the Minister for Higher Education's statement about the government's third runway decision, and I quote, I am not bound by the Cabinet decision. I ask, does the Prime Minister's peculiar version of government include any principle of collective ministerial responsibility? And does the Prime Minister expect the Minister to follow the example of the member for Barton and resign from the Ministry? Or will the Prime Minister roll over and let the Minister openly challenge his rapidly vanishing authority? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable yeah. Prime Minister. Mr. Uh, Speaker, uh, I was totally aware of the uh, particular interest and concern that the uh, Minister in question had about this issue, and uh, he was uh, given the opportunity, together with uh, another uh, member of the backbench, to put to. Uh, Order. Well, I am saying that. Uh, he, uh, with another member of the uh, backbench, spoke to the cabinet uh, last evening, and may I say, he made, uh, from his point of view, I believe, uh, an effective presentation of his concerns. He did it very responsibly. Uh, the processes have now been undertaken by the cabinet, having made a decision, a decision which has been endorsed by the cabinet. And I uh, expect uh, totally that the uh, minister in question will be uh, in line with the uh, decision of the government. The Honourable Member for Morton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. What response has the government received to representations to the Indonesian government about the tragedy in East Timor? What further information has come to light about these events? The Honourable Prime Minister. Yeah, uh, thank the Honourable Member for Morton for his question, Mr Speaker, and I'm sure that all members of the House uh, would be interested to, uh, to know the developments uh, of which we are aware, and I certainly want to share those with the member and with the House. Since I spoke to the House yesterday on this uh, issue, uh, our government has discussed at very high levels uh, with the Indonesian government the appalling events in uh, early yesterday. Yesterday afternoon, our ambassador in Jakarta, Mr Philip Flood, met General Madani, uh, who is acting foreign minister, uh, as well as minister for defence and security, and uh, Senator Evans had uh, long talks in Seoul uh, with Mr Alatas, the, uh, the Foreign Minister of Indonesia. In both these discussions, Mr Speaker, Australia expressed the points that I outlined to this House yesterday, that we are deeply disturbed by the tragedy in Dili and that we deplore the loss of innocent life, that we want an urgent account of what happened there and we want a full inquiry into the circumstances and that those found responsible be appropriately dealt with. In their responses, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, General Madani and Mr Alatas expressed deep concern and regret at what had occurred and understanding of the strong reaction that we in Australia have felt and that we have expressed about those events in Dili. Uh, in his uh, long discussion with Senator Evans, Mr Alatas agreed on the need for a full and an internationally credible inquiry and recognise the potential of the incident to undermine Indonesia's efforts to improve the situation in East Timor. The commander of Indonesia's armed forces, General Sutrisno, has publicly expressed his regret at the deaths and he's promised a thorough investigation. Now, Mr Speaker, let me say this, that the government welcomes these indications that Indonesia is responding positively to the concerns that we and other members of the international community have expressed about the events of Tuesday. But, Mr Speaker, I must say I am disappointed that they were not more fully reflected in the statement released last night by the Indonesian Embassy. We will, of course, continue to press our concerns and we will take a close interest in the manner in which the inquiry into the shootings is conducted as well as to the conclusions and the action which follows. Uh, Mr Speaker, turning to the, the second part of the question, uh, you will know that um, General uh, Sutrisno is reported to have told uh, journalists in Jakarta yesterday that at the most uh, 50 people died in the incident. Now, I want to stress, Mr Speaker, that whatever the final number of casualties, 
it is obvious that an appalling tragedy has occurred. It doesn't depend on what the final number is. An appalling tragedy has occurred. Both uh, General Madani and Mr Alatas have given us accounts of what occurred based on uh, preliminary information which it said is available to them. In addition, uh, Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to say our embassy official arrived in Dili yesterday afternoon and he will stay in Dili for several days so that he can speak to as many people as possible about the incident. It still is not possible to speak with any certainty about many of the details of the incident. The Indonesian authorities are themselves continuing with their inquiries and are awaiting the return of a number of key personnel from Delhi. Uh, the Indonesian authorities have said that the incident was provoked by an attack on an Indonesian military officer. Other witnesses, Mr Speaker, claim that there was no provocation. Uh, we are continuing to investigate these and other aspects of the incident, including, may I say, with non-government sources. It would be unwise to comment further until we have more details. Nonetheless, Mr Speaker, I hope it will be recognised that whatever provocation may have occurred, we don't say that any did, but it's important to say that whatever provocation may have occurred, if any, the response by the Indonesian military has been tragically excessive. And uh, I believe in saying that, uh, Mr Speaker, I would be reflecting the views not only of all members of this House, but of the people of this country. I conclude by saying this, Mr Speaker, that after all these years, it is clear that the problems of East Timor are not going to be solved by military force. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is for the Minister for Higher, Higher Education. And I ask the Minister in his capacity as a member of the Hawke Government, do you withdraw last night's statement and do you now totally endorse the Government's third runway decision? Yeah. Yeah. Come clean. The Honourable Minister. Uh, the, uh, I think, uh, frankly, if you're going to direct a question to me, you ought to find out what my areas of port portfolio responsibility are. But uh, having said that, having said that, I was uh, I was given permission, by, uh, an agreement of the cabinet that, that I and one other member would address the cabinet yesterday on the third runway issue because of our very major concerns about the implications of that issue for our electorate. We were permitted to do that on the basis that uh, we would not be bound by that cabinet decision, and that was, and that was, and that, uh, that was an explicit decision. That was the basis on which we addressed the cabinet on that occasion. The honourable member for Hinkler, order, order. The honourable member for Hinkler. The Mr. house Speaker. will come to order. Order, order. The honourable member for Hinkler. Mr Speaker, my question is directed Order. to the Treasurer. My Order. question is directed the to the Treasurer. Remember my start his question again. Mr Speaker, my question is directed to the Treasurer. Is the Treasurer aware of recent published critiques of market economics? Could the Treasurer outline to the House the government's approach to economic reform, and can it be characterised as being based on laissez-faire economics? The Honourable Treasurer. Mr Speaker, this question goes to the serious question of the philosophy and objectives of economic reform. And uh, the clear objective of economic policy is to raise the standard of living of all Australians. And this government holds, however, that an additional objective is to ensure that the process of economic change and reform is not disproportionately carried by those in the community least able to protect themselves. And it is a fact that those who argue for the unbridled and uncontrolled operation of markets in this country are arguing, in effect, for economic and social chaos. Order. They there is far too much noise in the chamber. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Treasurer. They propose a grand experiment, not with test tubes or white laboratory mice, but rather with the lives and values and preferences of the men and women of urban, regional and country Australia. They therefore display the characteristics of the cynic who, in the words of Oscar Wilde, knows the price of everything but the value of nothing, the cold, computer-driven conservatives. So, Mr Speaker, it was with interest that I read a recently published criticism of laissez-faire economics. And I must uh, tell the House that this criticism impressed me. Indeed, it amazed me, for it was uh, written with force and depth rarely observed in Australian intellectual life.
There is far too much noise. Order. The Honourable Treasurer. The, the Treasurer. Order. The House will come to order. The member for Gippsland will cease in ejecting. The Honourable Treasurer. The Leader of the National Party will cease in ejecting. The quote that has provoked the uh, question by the Honourable Member for Hinkler, Order. Mr Speaker, is are we going to risk the hopes, the achievements, the dreams and the aspirations of 17 million Australians on a theory of level playing field, economic rationalism, computer modelling, laissez-faire economics? Must we accept a better Australia means risking the very economic foundation on which this nation has been built over 100 years? We don't have to pull down, down those structures and rebuild the economy brick by brick. And of course, I must tell the House, Mr. Speaker, Order. that I rarely agree with the leader of the National Party in the Senate, Senate Senator Ron Boswell, whose quote it is. However, it is the case that I agree with him more once than he agrees with the leader of the opposition and the leader of the National Order. Party. Never. And I made the point yesterday, as did the Prime Minister, that the Nationals are desperate to shade the cloth of neoconservative rationalism. After all, the definition of a National Party member is merely a pork barrel in disguise. And we had it yesterday. The Queensland push signalled to the leader of the National Party through Bob Catter, Jr. that his leadership days are numbered. And this was reinforced over the weekend by Senator Ron Boswell, who dumped in a huge way on the National Party leader. And again, a quote. Try to, invoke, try to invoke the great leaders of the National Party from Sir Earl Page, John Order. McEwen the for and Doug Anthony, who fought and won victories for rural and regional Australia. And further, I'm told, Mr Speaker, that the member for Dawson is so concerned about the introduction of a consumption tax, which would hit hardest those in, uh, in his electorate, is considering resigning from the National Party in order to staff up his independent national group. So let me finish, Mr Speaker, by providing some advice to the Leader of the Opposition and the not-so-great Leader of the National Party. Never, never, ever trust Order. the National Party. I tell the you, leader of the I National tell Party the member for Barron, the Leader of the National Parties, watch the Queensland Nats, mate. They'll dump on you. They'll continue to dump on you. Order. There is far too much noise in the chamber. Thank you, Mr the Speaker. The My question without notice is to the Prime Minister. I asked the Prime Minister, in view of the, answer, the previous answer for the, of the Minister for Higher Education, would the Prime Minister detail the terms of the agreement that he had with that minister as to the nature of his participation in the third runway debate? Uh, who was the other minister that was referred to by the Minister for Higher Education? And do you accept what the minister has just said, that he's not bound by the Cabinet decision? The Honourable uh, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let, let me uh, make it quite clear what the position is. And, uh, well, Order. Well, this senseless guffaw we're used to, but let's, uh, let's wait until it's subsided. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what the position is, and I trust that uh, the Minister understands it. <laughs> well. Order. Well, um, the House will come to will order. You, if you just. If you, Order. if you just contain yourself, the position, I believe, will uh, be seen by you and even understood by you. Uh, I repeat what I said, uh, that the minister, uh, not in his capacity as minister, but as the... Um, uh, as the uh, oh, Mr. Speaker. Order. The House will come to order. The Prime Minister has been asked a question by the Leader of the Opposition. He's answering the question. But in the terms of the, the representation of his electorate, had uh, very deep concerns about what he understood was the uh, decision that uh, was going to be considered by the Cabinet. I had a discussion with him, and uh, I made it clear to him that uh, an opportunity could be provided. He wanted to speak, and uh, so he normally wouldn't have been at the uh, Cabinet meeting. I made the decision not just in respect to him, but as I knew that there were a number of uh, of uh, members in the Sydney region who were concerned about this issue and, in my judgment, understandably concerned, I, I, I decided that they should have the opportunity to make a presentation uh, to the Cabinet. And the minister in question was there in that capacity, not as a member of the, uh, of the ministry. That was the capacity in which he attended and... Well, Mr. Mr. Mr Speaker, the fact is that normally uh, he would not have been there. He wouldn't have been at the Cabinet meeting. And uh, there was a number of, uh, of uh, backbenchers who uh, were interested in this issue and uh, in their capacities uh, as members uh, representing uh, areas around the electorate and uh, around the airport. And I said 
and it was agreed by my colleagues in the Cabinet uh, that they should have the opportunity of making a presentation. Mr Baldwin was there in that capacity. He spoke, and after he and Mr Punch, who had the same opportunity, had spoken, they left the Cabinet room. Left the Cabinet room, played no part in the decision. And my point in doing that was to ensure that Mr Baldwin, in that capacity, was able to have made his presentation, and when the matter went to caucus, he would not be bound, having been there and made that presentation, he would be free in the caucus, totally free in the caucus, to argue his case and vote. Now, this was an eminently sensible and fair thing to do. It was something that was done by me with the support of the cabinet. But the position now is, the position now is that Mr Baldwin and every member of the caucus is bound by the government decision. The honourable member for Herbert. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question without notice is directed to the Minister for Resources and Acting Minister for Primary Industries. Is the Minister aware of recent claims that Australian ports are now amongst the most efficient grain loading ports in the world? Are these claims correct? And what benefits have flowed to Australian grain growers as a result of the government's microeconomic reforms to grain transport and loading? The Honourable Minister. I thank the honourable member for Herbert for his question. I have seen claims that uh, Australian ports are now amongst the most efficient grain handling uh, ports in the world, and I might say uh, that these uh, claims are not made in this instance by the government, but by the Australian Wheat Board in a press statement issued on the 4th of November. Mr. Speaker, in its statement, the board, uh, the Australian Wheat Board. Uh, uh, describes the improvements uh, evidenced on the uh, waterfront as, quote, spectacular, unquote, noting that since 1988-89, the time taken to turn grain vessels around at Australian ports has dropped from an average of 4.52 days to 2.4 days, almost a 50% uh, reduction, cutting in half the turnaround time and representing, importantly, savings of some $10 million per annum. Uh, Mr Speaker, importantly, the director of the Wheat Board says that reduction in loading time and the consequent uh, cost savings has resulted from the Australian Wheat Board's enthusiastic adoption of the reform principles negotiated with the Waterfront Industry Reform Authority, stevedoring industry unions and employers, and, importantly, the cooperation of the workforce at the ports in question. I might say, Mr Speaker, this stands in stark contrast to the opposition's, uh, if you like, fixed bayonet, uh, fixed bayonet policy of waterfront reform, uh, wherein uh, the Leader of the Opposition, amongst others, has indicated that the appropriate course to adopt is to send in the troops. Mr Speaker, there is no doubt that at a time when the grains industry is facing enormous difficulties, the government's microeconomic reform package is bearing fruit. It is substantially reducing the cost of grain handling at the waterfront, and there is a significant flow-on effect in terms of the reduction uh, in shipping freight costs. Mr Speaker, you and uh, honourable members will recall that when the government put uh, grain handling on the waterfront reform agenda uh, through the reforms recommended, recommended by the Royal Commission into Grain Storage Handling and Transport and uh, also uh, via the Interstate Commission Waterfront Report, and when the government set in train the Waterfront Industry Reform Authority process, which of course has made possible these spectacular gains through a negotiated process, the government was vigorously opposed by all of those opposite. And, Mr Speaker, everyone in this House will recall, and if per chance they forget, uh, I invite them to have recourse to the hand side on this matter, but everyone in this House will recall the deep divisions between the Liberal and the National Party on this very issue. There was a total, a chronic inability to put the national interests first in backing a vital program of microeconomic reform. And this opposition, this opposition had to be dragged kicking and screaming as the Hansard will attest, kicking and screaming 
to this fundamental reform. Now, there are, Mr. Speaker, two messages, two messages from these quote spectacular unquote gains. The first message, Mr. Speaker, is that the government's microeconomic reforms Order. are working. They are working, and Mr. Speaker, they are providing real benefits to grain growers at a time of great difficulty for them. And in summation, Mr. Speaker, my second point, it highlights the enormous gap, the enormous gap, indeed the chasm, between government substance and opposition rhetoric. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is again without notice to the Minister for Higher Education and Employment Services. I ask the Minister again in his capacity as a member of the Hawke government, do you withdraw your statement last night that you are not bound by the Cabinet decision? And do you now totally endorse the government's third runway decision? If not, when will you resign? Yeah. The Honourable the Minister. <laughs> the, um, uh, pri uh, the Prime Minister's description of the government uh, decision-making process is essentially accurate. It's an outcome which I uh, argued against strongly and which I regret. Uh, but, uh, I simply uh, endorse what the Prime Minister said by way of the government's uh, decision-making processes, and I'm not, going to, I'm not going to add anything further to a matter which, is outside, which lies outside oh, my, uh, cabinet responsi my ministerial responsibilities. The Honourable Member for Prospect. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to direct my question without notice to the Minister of Employment, Education and Training. Can the Minister inform the House of the Order. success of the existing labour market programs in assisting the unemployed into jobs? Even during the present recession. The Honourable Minister. I thank the Honourable Member for Prospect for her question, and uh, might I say that um, I'm aware of the very keen interest she has in this uh, area and uh, aware of the terrific job she's doing in terms of uh, assisting particularly the young people in her electorate. Um, the Member for Prospect asks the question of the uh, efficacy of uh, labour market programmes uh, conducted and delivered by my department. And uh, the department has uh, done some important work on uh, just this area. The department has uh, compared how program participants in the labour market programs, how many of them have jobs three months after they complete their placements, compared with those DSS beneficiaries generally who have uh, moved from social security payments into the labour market over the same period of time. And these figures show that those individuals who participate in labour market programs are much more likely to be in jobs than social security beneficiaries as a whole, even those who have been unemployed for the same period of time. Specifically, in August of 1991, for those unemployed for up to six months, 49 per cent of job start participants were still employed, that is, three months after they had finished their job start placement, and overall 36 per cent of labour market program participants had jobs, compared with just 13 per cent of those beneficiaries as a whole who had moved uh, into employment. The figures are even more stark when we take it for those people who have been unemployed for 12 months or longer where 47 per cent of job start participants still had jobs three months after they completed their placement, uh, and 21 per cent of those in labour market programs in general, compared with just 3 per cent of those who were uh, general uh, DSS uh, beneficiaries. So whilst uh, it may well be true that the recession has made it very much more difficult for unemployed and particularly long-term unemployed to uh, find jobs, those people who have the opportunity to participate in labour market programs and particularly in the Job Start uh, program have very much better chances of getting uh, jobs. I might say that uh, the announcements that the Prime Minister will be making this afternoon will indicate further enhancements to these uh, programs generally, uh, and we do this in the sure knowledge that these programs will be of particular benefit to those who participate in them. I might take the opportunity, uh, Mr Speaker, of uh, tabling a uh, chart which uh, indicates the efficacy of these programs uh, in the way in which I have described. 
Can I just uh, conclude by saying that um, whilst uh, we can anticipate that the opposition will have lots to say on the question of employment and unemployment this afternoon, and they have uh, a crocodile tears type resolution to put up in the context of uh, a matter of public importance this afternoon, it ought to be very clear to everyone just exactly where the opposition is coming from in relation to the assistance to the unemployed. Because if we go back to what the opposition said in the context of their economic action plan, and if we just go back to what they said in the context of the last budget, it is perfectly clear that one of the areas which has been targeted as an area of expenditure reduction is precisely this area of assistance to the unemployed. And what, what they have in mind is a dramatic reduction of some $288 million in expenditure programs here, which will deny assistance to something like 150,000 unemployed people. So whilst we, can see, so whilst we can expect to see some mock anguish on the part of the opposition this afternoon, let it be perfectly clear that this opposition has but one thing in mind, and that is to rip away the support, to deny additional support to these people who we are trying to assist in these difficult periods. And let me make it clear that the support that they are intending to rip away, the support that they are denying in terms of its extension, is real and beneficial support as indicated by these uh, figures that I, have, uh, by, that I have demonstrated. This isn't some kind of trivial support. This is meaning, so, meaningful support to unemployed people, people in real need, assisting them back into the labour market. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is again to the Minister for Higher Education and Employment Services. And I ask the Minister again in his capacity as a member of the Hawke Government, does the Minister acknowledge without qualification that he is bound by the Cabinet's decision on the third runway, yes or no? The Honourable the Minister. Order. Nothing to add to my previous answer. The Honourable Member for Oxley. Order. Order. I warn the Honourable Member for Kuyong. The Member for Oxley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. Mr. Mr. Speaker, my, my question is addressed to the Minister for Health, Housing and Community Services, and the Minister would be aware of some concerns expressed in my electorate regarding the uh, people with disabilities. I ask the Minister, can he inform the House what steps he has taken to reassure the community the Minister for Immigration the will cease interjecting for services for people with disabilities? The Member for Benelong, if the Member for Benelong continues to interject, I will. I warn the member for Benelong. <laughs> if he wants to have a conversation, he can go outside. If he continues to have the conversation, he might be sent out. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Order. <coughs> the Honourable Deputy could, Prime uh, Minister. I thank uh, the Honourable Member for his, uh, for his question. I'm certainly aware of his uh, interest in the area of uh, disabilities and uh, concerns that he's uh, conveyed to me. Uh, uh, concerning uh, uh, possible uh, changes and directions in this uh, program. Only uh, this morning at a major meeting of service providers, uh, the Akrod National Convention, I spoke about the government's uh, considerable achievements in relation to disability services and its intentions with regard to the future. The government's uh, disability services program, as honourable members will, honourable members will know, is uh, a key uh, aspect of uh, our commitment to uh, social justice, and particularly social justice uh, for this particular group, uh, who often have been denied the opportunity for full uh, participation in the community. This morning I announced that the government would be amending the Disability Services Act to lay permanently to rest the anxiety about services closing after June 1992. The amendments will remove the June 1992 uh, deadline and hence provide for the continued funding of services which meet basic levels of service. Organisations will have more time to make the changes necessary to provide a good quality service, one which reflects the basic human rights of people with a disability and gives them more say in how their services work. I also announced that the extension of time would be linked to other changes designed to help services continue 
to work towards meeting the requirements of the Disability Services Act. There will be three key steps. Minimum outcomes or basic human rights, such as people with disability being supported to set up workers' committees where they work or residence committees uh, where they live. In other words, uh, uh, the opportunity for people uh, in the various uh, workshop and services uh, to uh, have access to uh, uh, basic rights to air a grievance and to have that grievance dealt with in a way which is seen to be uh, uh, fair. Secondly, uh, enhanced outcomes or more advanced standards, uh, such as improved wage levels for people with sheltered workshops. I think people who know anything about this area will know that uh, the wage levels uh, in sheltered works workshops are extraordinarily low, uh, averaging uh, often around uh, uh, $30 a week or something of that order, and having no relationship at all to any productivity contributed by people uh, uh, with disabilities. And then thirdly, eligibility outcomes or full implementation of the principles and objectives of the Disability Services Act, such as integration into open employment. Services which have not met uh, minimum uh, outcomes, uh, Mr Speaker, by June 1992 will be subject to sanctions, including no access to indexation and transition funds. All service providers will generally be expected to reach uh, eligibility outcomes by June 1995. Mr Speaker, the Disability Services Act uh, is one of the uh, most significant reforms uh, of this uh, government. It has itself uh, resulted uh, in significant changes uh, in the attitude to people with disabilities, in the qualities of service being provided. There is a very large number of uh, new services, over 100 uh, new services that are funding, uh, being funded. There has been something like a 60 per cent real increase in funding for services with people with disabilities. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, the uh, strategy, uh, strategy which I announced this morning, uh, I believe, will be a successful strategy, enabling, enabling us to build on uh, what has already been achieved uh, under the Act, uh, but at the same time uh, uh, dealing with those uh, concerns that have been expressed by some service providers. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, in view of the failure of the Minister for Higher Education and Employment Services to publicly support your government's decision on the third runway without qualification, will you require him to make an unequivocal public statement of support for your government's decision, or will you require him to resign? Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I am glad that the uh, Leader of the Opposition has returned to this question uh, for two reasons. Firstly, it enables me to dispose of this matter, and then to— uh, yeah. and then— to dispose of this Order. question and then to reveal his uh, unbridled hypocrisy. Now, let me, uh, let me, say, let me say in regard to this matter that uh, I made it quite clear in my statement in this House a while ago what the position is. I repeat it just so that, per chance, just perhaps the Leader of the Opposition might understand. The situation is that uh, Mr Baldwin had the opportunity of speaking to the Cabinet. He spoke, and uh, he spoke on the basis uh, that uh, uh, he uh, left after he had spoken, and he was not bound in terms of the subsequent caucus consideration of that matter by the decision of the Cabinet. He still had opened his position to argue in the caucus a position different to that adopted by the Cabinet. He exercised, he exercised that right, but once the caucus then had considered that Cabinet decision and uh, that was endorsed by the uh, caucus, then not only Mr Baldwin but every member of the caucus bound by the decision. And In his statement in answer to the question, he said that he accepted my exposition, as he must do. Now, Mr Speaker, having disposed Order. of that, let, let, let me, Mr Speaker, as I say, having disposed of that, let me expose the hypocrisy of the Leader of the Opposition. May, I ask, may I ask rhetorically, uh, Mr Speaker, May I ask rhetorically, Mr Speaker, whether the Leader of the Opposition has carpeted the member for Benelong? Because the member for Benelong uh, publicly exposed much of his private reservations about the political judgment of the Leader of the Opposition. He went, he went, he went uh, Mr Speaker, to the National Press Club and he's indicated Mr Speaker, that he has a different view about this uh, question of uh, state tax. He's indicated that he thinks that the position that uh, I have adopted and the government adopted is right. 
But, of course, in agreeing with me, he disagrees with his leader. Because you will recall that last week, and then under pressure this week, the leader of the opposition Order. totally identified himself, totally identified himself with the proposition that the state should have a right to levy an income tax. That's the position of the leader of the opposition. The member for Bennelong, a member of his front bench, explicitly and publicly repudiated it. So instead of worrying about some uh, fic fictitious problem that I'm supposed to have with Mr Baldwin, I suggest that you try and get some degree of orderliness, uniformity and consistency Order. on your the front bench Benelong on the question of whether the state should have a right to have a, uh, an income tax. I only hope, Mr Speaker, that the Leader of the Opposition continues to adhere to his view, that he overcomes the member for Benelong's objections and that the position of the Opposition maintains one of being that you support the right of the states to have an income tax. Sort the member for Benelong out. We've got no problems on our side. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Shortland. Mr Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Transport and Communications. I ask the Minister, has his attention been drawn to reports that Evergreen Airlines propose operating airline service to Australia? If there is any substance to those reports, uh, what information can you provide to the House on the Government's intentions in respect to that matter? The Honourable Minister. I did, uh, I did notice Order. If the Honourable uh, Member for Bruce continues to interject, I will name him. I did notice reports in the paper today which suggested that uh, there had been some understanding given by the government to Evergreen Airlines that uh, there would be an opportunity for them to act as our second international carrier. I would have to say that those reports uh, are totally without foundation. This is not a matter that. Uh, is, uh, has been for, there for a great deal of public debate, but it uh, is a, a fact that uh, there has been uh, discussions between the Victorian government and uh, Evergreen Airlines for from, from time to time, or the principal of Evergreen Airlines from time to time, on what type of role they might play uh, in the Victorian area. And uh, there are a set of quite interesting proposals, I think, on the table in that regard. But it has always been made absolutely clear uh, by the government to the Victorian government and also to uh, uh, representatives of Evergreen these things. The first is uh, that the Australian government has made a clear-cut decision on the issue of designation of a second carrier. And we have said that uh, for the life of this parliament at least, and that doesn't anticipate a change of policy, but uh, it is a decision that, uh, for the life of this parliament at least, there will be one designated passenger carrier operating from Australia, and that will be Qantas. We will not be designating anyone else. We have also made clear uh, that it is open to airlines operating to Australia, uh, and Evergreen is now one of those, under the uh, terms of the agreement that we now have with Taiwan, which I might say is going extremely well and has been one of the many advances in international <laughs> aviation that we've made during the course of this year. Under the terms of that, the principles of Evergreen are, as with the principles of any other international airline operating to Australia, entitled, if they wish, uh, to uh, bid for 25 per cent of Australian when that comes on the market. And uh, that, uh, of course, uh, if they are principles of airlines uh, that uh, do not operate to Australia or, for that matter, any other uh, foreign uh, business, uh, businessman, uh, they are entitled to uh, look at a higher percentage than that. But uh, 25 per cent is that limitation. And, of course, they would be very welcome to do that if they wanted to do so, express their interest in that and involve themselves. But there is no implicit or explicit government undertaking uh, that uh, there will be an opportunity by virtue of such an investment uh, to uh, participate then in a, uh, in a second designated carrier. I would not anticipate the government going down the road of a, uh, a second designated passenger uh, carrier from this country, but I would imagine if anyone were to turn their minds to that subsequently, it would be quite clear that that would be an opportunity that would be tendered, not granted. And uh, as I said, that's not saying that we have any intentions in that regard at all. So there could be no anticipation. Now, there's been no understanding, as I said, explicit, implicit, or whatever, uh, that such an opportunity is going to arise. 
The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is again to the Minister for Higher Education and Employment Services. And I refer the Minister to a previous answer in question time this afternoon, where he referred to uh, the Prime Minister's description of the government's decision-making process as essentially accurate, and then failed to give an unequivocal statement of support for the government's third runway decision. So I ask the Minister three questions. How, uh, how is the Prime Minister's uh, description of the decision-making process is inaccurate? Second, did you do a radio interview after the Cabinet and caucus processes were completed yesterday, in which you said you were not bound by the Cabinet decision? And third, will you now give an unequivocal statement of support for the government's decision on the third runway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable yeah. Minister. Uh, Order. You really are starting to uh, go into cracked record mode, aren't you? Am I going to have to, how many times am I going to have to reiterate what I've already said? The, the Prime Minister's description of the government decision-making process is accurate. I said that two questions ago. If you, if you, if you, if you want to, uh, I, I simply am not going to add anything further to that. And uh, I suggest you find a, and that's the same answer you're going to get every subsequent time you ask this question. The honourable member for Bray. Order. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for uh, Transport and Communications, and I refer to an article in the Adelaide Advertiser of November the 11th, reporting comments by the South Australian Minister for Marine Bob Gregory, expressing concern with the federal government decision to close down four Spencer Gulf navigational aids, and claiming this action has been taken without consultation with the South Australian government. Can the minister advise what consultative process has been involved with the decision to discontinue these navigation aids and the reasons for the decision? The Honourable Minister. I, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. He has raised this matter with me. Now, since late last year, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, AMSA, has been con consulting with the South Australian Department of Marine and Harbours on the proposed decommissioning of four navigation aids located in the northern Spencer Gulf. AMSA is responsible for meeting the Commonwealth's responsibility for providing navigation aids network to meet the needs of commercial shipping, that is, large merchant vessels. All costs of operating this network are met by the commercial shipping industry through payment of the marine navigation levy. Navigation aids for ports, rivers and inner waterways, and those specifically for fishing and pleasure craft, are provided by state governments or the local authorities that are concerned. In reviewing the navigation aids provided in the Spencer Gulf, AMSA relied on advice from the Maritime Services Advisory Committee, a consultative body drawn from the shipping industry which provides advice to AMSA, amongst other things, on changes in the navigation aids network. The committee consulted their respective associations and ship's masters transiting the Spencer Gulf and, in October last year, confirmed to AMSA that the commercial shipping industry did not have a continuing requirement for those four navigation aids. There are a number of other Commonwealth and state navigation aids in the northern Spencer Gulf, marking hazards and allowing fixing of position on the recommended shipping tracks and port approaches. One of the four aids concerned, the Middle Bank Beacon, is redundant because of overlapping coverage provided by other lights. The other three lights are not required for navigation by commercial ships. In fact, two of the three are ageing structures in poor condition and are considered hazardous to AMSA maintenance staff. Hence, AMSA proposes to decommission these four navigation aids rather than continue to impose their cost on the commercial shipping industry, unless the State Department of Marine and Harbours wants to take responsibility for them. I think the confidence attributed to Mr Gregory indicates these lights are needed as port approach beacons and to assist fishing and pleasure craft. As these are clearly state responsibilities, it is within the purview of his department to uh, take responsibility for them. Uh, Mr Gregory, uh, the concerns he's raised and local councils in the region about this issue have been referred to AMSA. However, the bottom line for AMSA is continuing to impose a charge on commercial shipping for navigation services that they do not require. Already the chairman of Australian National Maritime Association has been critical of the benefits of shipping reform being eaten away uh, by increased state government charges, particularly port charges. And I think it's very important to ensure that that does not occur. And therefore, if the South Australian government wishes this to continue, and they may have, uh, have uh, reason, from, in the light of uh, the, uh, the circumstances in which they find themselves with pleasure craft in that, uh, that area, to 
decide to, uh, to, to continue with them, but that is a matter that they ought to uh, wholly meet themselves. The situation is with, um, uh, uh, these, with our, our shipping uh, uh, operations. If they are obliged to do it, uh, then they're likely to kick up very strongly. And I think it would be very helpful, uh, because I know you're a man of some substantial influence with the uh, South Australian government, if you were to uh, go along and, uh, and have a bit of a chat to them and, and strongly advocate to them that if they see real value in this, and only they can know that from the pattern of usage of uh, pleasure craft of the area. Only they can know that. Uh, it would be very, uh, very useful if you could go on and point to them that uh, it would be sensible for them to uh, spend the money on, the, on that activity. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Ask that further question, please.